grace of God or we won't make it. That's good, brother. Amen. All right. I'll preach to you tonight for just a few minutes. And then we'll take the Lord's Supper here in a minute. I want you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 15 and verse 13. <coughs> Genesis 15 and verse 13. The divine text says, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Father, I pray now that you'd anoint the word as it goes forth. I pray that you'd open the hearts of the people to receive it. And I pray it does fall on good ground. In thy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. We start with a prophecy in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, of course, by its very name, is the book of beginnings. Bereshith in Hebrew means in the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning, the beginning. The last book of the Bible is the Apocalypsis, or into the future, the opening, the unveiling of what comes. So the Bible is a book that encompasses all time, past, present, and future. We have a prophecy in the book of Genesis. This prophecy relates to the seed of Abraham. Note carefully, his seed. When you look in the book of Galatians, you'll find out that Abraham's seed was the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his spiritual seed. You'll also find out that he has physical seed. The physical seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I know you are Abraham's seed, or you are Abraham's children to the Pharisees, is the Jew, the Hebrew at that time, and the Jew. That's the physical seed of Abraham. Notice carefully. Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land. Four hundred years they spent in that land. Now notice something else about this. We come to the people of the land, Exodus chapter number 1 and verse 13, and we find them in bondage. The scripture says in Exodus 1, 13, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. That word rigor means ruthlessness. It means that they put the whip to their back. It means that they drove them like slaves. It means that they had no joy or comfort to be found at all in the land of Egypt. What had at one time been a wondrous thing where God had allowed them to come in under Joseph and to be spared from the famine of the land had now turned into a living hell. So in Exodus chapter number 1 and verse 13, we come to the people, the seed of Abraham, Genesis 15, 13, and they are in bondage. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter number 12 and verse number 12. While there, there's a confrontation between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the false gods of Egypt. This is important. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am Jehovah. I am the Lord. Notice carefully that this is a battle between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the gods of Egypt. Notice that this battle is fought on a high spiritual level. Note carefully that God not, is not saying that I am going to execute judgment on the people of Egypt, upon a human being, but I'm coming to execute judgment on their gods. In plainer words, their gods and I are going to face off. We're going to have a confrontation. There's going to be a battle that ensues. And depending on who wins this battle will determine who is set free or who is allowed to leave or who the bondage is lifted from. So we are going to go to battle. We see a little more about that battle in the book of Daniel. We read where Daniel was praying for his people and God sent an angel, angel he sent an emissary. And the Bible says that for 21 days he was hindered from reaching his destination. He said the prince of Persia and the prince of Grecia had come out and they'd fought against me. But I fought. And now here I am. The last chapter of the book of Daniel says that Michael stands for thy people. Or he stands for Israel. Michael is the only angel in the whole Bible that is mentioned to stand in particular for a certain group of people. Michael is the only angel in the Bible that is mentioned as an archangel. Although we think Gabriel may be and maybe others. But Michael, his name means who is like God or who is like unto God. 
Michael is quite a is quite a, is quite a person is quite an angel. For the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter number twelve, that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And when they fought against the dragon, the fighting was over the children of Israel. What is going to happen to them? And according to the book of Revelation, chapter number twelve, this dragon sends forth a flood to destroy the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here on this earth. Satan hates that seed. He hates that seed with a passion. There's nothing changed about that seed. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their seed are the physical seed of, uh, of, this, of Abraham. And, and, and they are, being the physical seed of Abraham, are the direct uh, target of Satan to destroy them. And from the moment that the prophecy was given in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 15, that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, Satan is set about from that moment on to destroy that seed. But he did not understand at the time that that prophecy was given that the seed referred to there was a spiritual seed, the seed of God, when he impregnated a virgin girl, the virgin daughter of Zion. And that spiritual seed gave birth. That spiritual seed gave birth to the God-man. And every one of you in this house tonight are part of that spiritual seed because you came forth from that spiritual seed. And so this persecution that comes from Pharaoh and his people against the seed of Abraham is always the persecution of he that is born after the flesh, persecuting he that is born after the spirit. And so it is to this very day. I want you to notice as the battle rages, notice that deliverance only comes through the blood of the Lamb. In Exodus chapter number 12 and verse number 7, the Bible said, They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And in verse number 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token, an ensign, upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you as to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, it is going to surely happen. Nothing is going to stop it. And the only thing that will matter that night is the blood of the Lamb. Amen. The blood of the Lamb is a token, an ensign. It's that ensign like when the children of Israel gathered around the tabernacle. Every last tribe had its own flag. It had its own ensign. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah's flag was the lion. Revelation 5, 5, the Lord Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Each one of these incense corresponds to a constellation. They represent the message of the stars long before it was ever written on paper. It was written in the heavens. The, the heavens declare the glory of God. The ensign therefore becomes the banner and the standard that represented who they were. It marked them and it's what they fought under. <laughs> and so he said it's for you a token over your house. It represents you, it's who you are, and that's what you'll fight under. We will fight under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our ensign. He is the captain of our salvation. To Joshua, he said, take your shoes off, for the ground you stand on is holy ground. Holy, holy, holy unto me. If you expect to, beat, to defeat Jericho, it'll only be done by the power of God. You physically are not able to breach those walls, you can't take that city. But with the power of God and the blood covenant, the holy ground you stand on, nothing can withstand the blood. And so they are delivered by the power of the blood of Christ. Once again, we come to a prophecy. Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 15. And he said unto them with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you. Before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is a prophecy. The Lord's Supper, when instituted, was instituted from the Passover. 
Pascha, the suffering, the suffering of the Lamb. It was instituted from the, from, the, from the memorial that was the beginning of the year, the beginning of the calendar with Israel. There is no question that this Israel, the start of their calendar, the beginning of their calendar, was associated absolutely and completely with salvation and redemption. If there is no salvation and no redemption, forget the rest of it. All the other feast days had no meaning. There must be a redemption and a salvation. And the redemption and the salvation is based on a blood covenant. Hakene diatheke. The cutting of a covenant. And the blood must be shed. The Lord Jesus Christ said, this is the New Testament. Hakene diatheke. This is the new covenant in my blood. But to these Jews, to these Jews and the translators of the Bible, instead of calling it covenant, they call it testament. The word could have been translated covenant just as easily as testament. Say, why didn't they translate it covenant instead of testament? Because the covenant is made with the Jewish people. The blood covenant at the cross at Calvary will be their covenant. Hebrews chapter number 8. This is the covenant that I will make with you and I will take away your sins. But the Gentiles are brought in by virtue of that testament of our Lord and Savior, and we enjoy the benefit of the blood covenant because there's only one covenant. Not two, three, not four, five, six, seven. There's not a covenant for the Gentile and a covenant for the Jew. There's just one blood covenant. But the testament means that he can will it and bequeath it to us. And thanks be unto God that I, a dog, blind, Gentile dog, wandering out here without hope and without God and lost in the world, was brought in by the mercy and the grace of the Lord into this covenant. And now I enjoy fully the benefits of the blood covenant. That blood covenant, my dear friends, is the prophecy that he gives us here in the book of Luke. And that prophecy is that we will sit down one day at a table in my father's kingdom and we will take this once again. And I will not rest because that's the point. I will not rest until that is done, until that is finished. Notice that when he comes, he finds the people in bondage. Second Corinthians, this is a completely, this is just identical to what happened in the Old Testament. It's happening in the New. And we find the people in bondage as we found them in bondage in, in Egypt. We find them in bondage in the world. Second Corinthians chapter number three and verse six. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. Watch carefully. That by means of death, death became an instrument for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. In other words, his death paid for everything that happened past. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews 2.15 And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There is no question that when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, mankind was in bondage. Even though he had the Ten Commandments. Even though he had the First Covenant. Even though he had the Law of God. The law of God could never make him free. The only thing that can make you free is the Son of God. Amen. And the only way that that can be done is by the blood covenant. Now here's what happened. When the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross at Calvary, he entered the power of devil, the power of Satan. The scripture says that through weakness he was crucified. But he reigns by the power of God. In plainer words, he took the most, he took the, he took the thing that was the most powerful power of Satan, which is death. Satan is the killer. He took on Satan in his domain and his, and his place of death. And there he met him, met him eyeball to eyeball. If he could destroy Satan's power of death, then he could destroy Satan's authority over you. Because that, the Bible said death reigned from Adam to Christ. And if he could destroy the power of death, then he would break the power of Satan. And therefore he would break the bondage of the devil, who is the God of this world. Did he break that power? He broke it on the third day when he arose from the dead. And was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And we have been begotten again by, a, by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. There's something about the resurrection of Christ that has to do with your new birth. 
And there's something about the resurrection of Christ that has to do with his identity. And both of these things put together leads me to believe that until the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, all that he promised, all that he is, and everything that he does for mankind was not ratified, brought into power and being until he came forth from the dead. And when he came forth from the dead, the power of Satan was broken at that very moment. And now he reigns in power and glory at the right hand of the Father. And he destroyed Satan in his weakness. And Satan threw his power against him. There's a confrontation between the God of this world and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible says, Hebrews, in chapter, number, Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 14... For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver, deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Here we have a confrontation. Note carefully that the Bible says that when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he came and he came against principalities, against powers, against the spiritual rulers of the darkness of this world. He came against all spiritual wickedness when he came into this world and he came against their daddy, the devil. He came against him. Notice carefully, he didn't come against men. His battle was not with mankind. His battle was, was with Satan. The spiritual battle that is fought right above our heads is far more important than a physical battle that takes place inside your body. Every country has its own representative. It has a spiritual representative that represents it in this powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. Every country has its own representative. I wonder who represents America. I believe that the representative of America has changed. There was a time when a holy angel represented us, fought for us in the arena of spiritual conflict, but I believe that changed. And boy, what a mess we're in now. This is why the floodgates are opening. This is why you see everything in the world happening that you never thought would ever happen in your lifetime. You ladies right now, when you go into a bathroom, have no idea if a man's going to walk in behind you. And then another one with a badge on is going to protect him. And another one sitting behind the governor's chair in a state is going to protect that one. You have no idea what you're about to face when you go out into the world. Notice carefully, it is not manhood or the men that are being assaulted, it's the women. Right now, ladies, it's in a transition period, but you let these transgender men begin to compete in women's athletics and they will completely destroy women's athletics. When the men can compete on the same floor at the same time with the women and yet call himself a woman, yet he's still a man, you're going to see a complete upheaval of women's sports in this country. Why in the world that the feminist and the leaders of the women's movement cannot see that is beyond me. It's coming. Fact is, it's already here. I believe it was a Hawaiian, transgender Hawaiian, that competed in a women's sport in some part, I forget what sport it was, and he won the gold medal. He, posing as a she, competing against women, won the gold medal, and they let it happen. We are completely insane. We've turned it upside down. And let me give out a warning. There are parts of this country where these old rough bush men see some man go into a bathroom behind their little 14-year-old daughter. Something's going to happen. You'll see it happen as sure as you live. Not that I want to see it happen, but that's the way of nature. A man, if he sees a man going into a women's bathroom following his little daughter, you think he's going to countenance that? It doesn't make any difference what law they say. They say the law. What law? You talk, let, me, let me ask you a question about the law. I know I'm chasing the rabbit, but I've got to get this one while I'm at it. When you talk about it's the law, what about these sanctuary cities and these sanctuary states? 
that thumb their nose in fed, in the, to, to federal law. They tell you it's the law on one hand, but do as they please on the other. And expect you to be so dumb that you're going to follow their dictates. Something will happen in this country, folks. Yes, it will. It won't be pretty. Something will happen in this country, and it won't be pretty. We live in a time of calling evil good and good evil. We can't even differentiate between what's right and wrong. But notice carefully, there is deliverance only through the blood of the Lamb. Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Notice carefully in the book of Revelation. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. If your church is not preaching the blood, you don't know anything about overcoming. <laughs> if your church is not preaching blood, you know nothing about salvation. If your church is not preaching blood, you know nothing about redemption. You are not redeemed by liturgy and by so-called Christian symbols and by crosses hanging on walls or by, or by, or by uh, doves coming down out of the sky. And all of these things no doubt can have a place somewhere, but that has nothing to do with your redemption. You're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Now I took the book of Revelation and I thought to myself, since the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible and the book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible, so many things that start in Genesis finish in Revelation. They do. And I believe that the book of Revelation is the completion of the canon. It finishes it. I've had folks ask me about the book of Enoch. A number of them have. And they're saying a preacher should not Enoch be part of the canon. And I've said yes, and I'm saying not yes, it should be. But in time past, Christian groups have made the book of Enoch uh, part of the canon. In other words, they say it is inspired scripture. I don't believe that. I'm going to stick with 66 books. 39 Old Testament, 27 New. We don't need any more that we call scripture. So the last book of the Bible, when it talks about blood, says this. Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Blood washes your sins away. Amen. Revelation chapter number 5 and verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Redemption is through the blood. In plain words, the blood buys you back. Revelation 6 verse 10, They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? We have the avenger of blood show up in Revelation. Revelation 19, 2, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. The kinsman redeemer shows up in the book of Revelation. The kinsman redeemer, the most beautiful picture of it, is in the book of Ruth. For the kinsman redeemer must be qualified to redeem you. He must belong to your family to redeem you. He must have the right to redeem you. And so the redeemer had to come down from glory and took part of the same so that he could step into the arena with Satan and had a legitimate right to represent you. Have you noticed how legal all of these things are? If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The reason for the legality, the reason that the Bible, now let's not say Bible, the reason that the legal profession uses biblical terms, Bible was here first. The reason the legal profession uses biblical terms is because it is a legal thing today. You're standing with God. The Bible said you have been justified by the blood of Christ. Justified means that God has declared you innocent, not guilty. That's what justification means. Not guilty. You say, well, I am guilty. Yes, but your guilt has been put on the head of the Son of God. And so God can say, not guilty. And when Satan comes to accuse you before God, the Bible says you have an advocate with the Father. The same word translated advocate is also translated in the book of John, chapter number 16. I will send you a comforter. Parakletos is the Greek word. 
It means one who goes alongside, bears the heart and the soul and the meaning of the individual that they go with. He is your representative. He's your comforter. He comforts you with the power of God by the finished work of Christ. Like the angels comforted Christ when he was in the garden of Gethsemane. Remember? The Bible said the angels came and they ministered to him. So it is that when you step into the legal court and Satan has legal right to accuse you, the comforter, the advocate steps up and says, hold on. Hold on. Everything you say is true, but it's paid for. He's been justified and he's been redeemed and forgiven by the blood of Christ. And boy, we need that. I know you don't see that happen, but it happens as sure as you hear me. This is why when the Christian, when the Christian sins, one of the first things you should do when you sin is plead the blood. Lord, cleanse me from this sin. Cleanse me from this guilt. Cleanse me from this condemnation. Cleanse me. Protect me. Build a wall around me. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Christ. And that will work for cleansing your sins and it will work for sending demons away from you. For the demons don't like the blood. In the book of Revelation, chapter number uh, 7 and verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is the testimony of these people that is sealed in blood. Yeah. Notice carefully. They washed their robes in what? Blood. What color is blood? So they took their robes, washed them in red blood, and they came out white. <laughs> right? Robes white and clean. Red blood, wash sins away, robe becomes white. Notice how that it's all about sin. It's all about the condemnation of sin. And the witness is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? What can make my robes white again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You can't live the Christian life without the blood. You can't have a relationship with the Lord without the blood. And then notice what it says in chapter number 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They overcame him how? By the blood of the Lamb. They didn't overcome him by their testimony. They didn't overcome him by their diligence, by their ability, by their rank, by their stature, by their money. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And then finally, Revelation 19, verse 13. He was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John, in Genesis 4, 10, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. From thy hand, the blood is a witness of righteousness. The blood here has a witness twofold. It witnesses to the wickedness and the vile character of those that he's going to judge. But it also represents the blood that he comes to fight under. He's fighting under the banner of the blood once again. Even the Lord Jesus Christ has on his vesture blood. That blood marks him. That blood makes it important for him, for you to understand. He doesn't come clean and white and beautiful and shining with all, of the, with all the stars and all the banners and everything of heaven. He comes in a robe dipped in blood. He's coming as a man of war. And this blood is a witness of righteousness. He's coming in righteous judgment on the earth. The judgment that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bring to this earth, my dear friend, is not judgment to a single generation. It's a judgment to every generation. When this is consummated at the great white throne judgment, all of the sins of all mankind from the first murderer Cain until the last one to draw breath on this earth will be brought in judgment on that day on the great white throne. And there, the only thing that can exonerate the guilty is the blood of Christ. And it's so sad because it'll be too late then. I can't find one place in the Bible where anyone is saved at the great white throne. Can you? The great white throne is the final witness of God to seal the fate of those who are there. You have other judgments throughout the Bible, many of them. We all know the judgment seat of Christ shows up in 1 Corinthians. We understand that. We understand that the judgments that happen in this earth when God judges people and nations. But the judgment of the great white throne 
is final and absolute. If I were you tonight, I would be certain that I had the one who was judged at Calvary and became sin for me who knew no sin. I would be certain that I had that one on my side, cleansing my sins away. I would be certain that the Lord Jesus Christ was not just something I thought about. He was someone I believed in from my heart and from my soul. And I believe in him. And I love him and I bless him and I praise him. And when I go home tonight, if I go home tonight, if I make it home, I'll lay my head on the bed and I'll talk to him two or three o'clock in the morning, the wee hours of the night. When I awaken, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him throughout the day. I'll talk to him on the way in here tonight. I'll talk to him before I ever get up and open this Bible. I'll talk to him over here. I talk to him in all kinds of places. Don't ever let Satan limit you to one place to talk to the Lord. Don't let him wear you out all day long, get you busy, and then you're so wore out and tired that you can't pray late in the night, and then Satan's defeated you in that day. Talk to him all day long. Does the Bible say to do that? It's to pray without ceasing, to be in an attitude of prayer. Now, this is one of the most solemn occasions that we have in the church. This right here. This is not a sacrifice. He sacrificed himself one time for sins forever and sat down at the right hand of the Father. We are not sacrificing Christ every time we do this. What's that for? You only be, he only need to be sacrificed one time. You don't need a perpetual sacrifice of the Son of God. This is not going to be his literal body and his literal blood. It's not even going to be turned into his body and his blood. Because you don't need to take his body and his blood over and over and over and over again. When you took his body and his blood was when you believed on him. You accepted the New Testament. This is the New Testament in my blood. This cup represents the new covenant. You can't drink that cup. That cup was 2,000 years ago. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are what? Exactly. Receive him tonight by faith. What he did for you by faith. And if you've done that, you've received the body of Christ. You've received all of Christ. You've received everything that he has for you. You can't receive him by taking anything off of this table. But what you will be doing is remembering him and looking forward to the future till he comes. That's why I brought this message to you tonight. It is both remembrance and a prophecy of the coming of the Lord. Father, in thy name we pray that you bless your holy word tonight to the people. Bless it to their hearts. Bless them, Father, as we take this communion, as we come together. We come together joyfully because of what you did for us. We know who you are. We know why you did it. And we exalt your holy name tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. There is nothing in the Bible that tells us how to do this. You will find that people have celebrated the communion of the Lord in many different ways. They all do the same thing as far as the bread and the wine. But they may do it in a different fashion. I know of some churches where people just take it. And they go off alone somewhere out in the field and they have their own little ceremony and they take the Lord's Supper. Ever since I've been in the Baptist church, this is all I've ever known is the way we do it in here. We come together as a body of believers and we come together as a body of believers and we take the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and, and, and that's the way we do it. That's not to say if someone does it a little differently that, it's, that that's wrong. But I do believe this. I do believe what, ma what matters the most is not the manner in which you do it. It's what's in your heart and in your soul, what it means to you. I pray now that as we do this, that your heart's right with God and that everything is, is settled. And the only way to do that, a simple matter, it's a simple matter. Lord Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me in the precious blood of Christ. Cleanse me, cleanse my sins. And if you tonight, there's not going to be a perfect person in this house to take the Lord. None of you are perfect. You're not going to be perfect until you are perfected. When he perfects the saints, the spirits of just men made perfect, when that happens, then you'll be perfected. But until that happens, you can be covered by the blood. Do you think those people inside that house when the death angel came through Egypt that night, do you think they were perfect? No, but they were covered by the blood. That's what you want tonight. You want to be covered by the blood. You may not know all, everything in the depths of your heart. You may not be able to confess every sin you've committed. You might have forgotten about them. But you can certainly tonight plead the blood and say, Lord Jesus, cleanse me 
Cleanse me from unknown hidden sins. Cleanse me from sins I've forgotten. Cleanse me in the name of Jesus. Cleanse me tonight from sin. Now, you don't have to be a member of this church. If you're visiting tonight and you're saved, you're born again, you're welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us. All that we ask is that everyone do the same thing. Make sure that you're right with God. Let's have a prayer before we go any further. Father, I pray for every soul. Lord, I want them to, with joy, to take the Lord's Supper. I want them to, with victory tonight, to take the Lord's Supper. And Father, I want it to be a blessing to every soul in this house. Our Father, tonight, the Lord's Supper, next Sunday, Easter. These two coming together, so close as they did in history. The Passover and then the, and then the, uh, and then the crucifixion. I pray in Jesus' name now that you'd bless them and cleanse them. In thy holy name we pray. Amen.